Have you ever thought, man, sometimes I'm really funny, even if everybody else isn't laughing? Well, it turns out you are. I'm your host, George Nagel, and today we're going to talk with somebody who has spent his entire career in the world of comedy and can help you transition that into your everyday life. Let's get started. Paul Dornan has worked in the TV and book comedy world for over two decades as a writer, producer, script mentor, and third guard from the left in his own prison film comedy. He's written sketch shows, sitcoms, drama series, and a number one best-selling comedy book. He has worked with a galaxy of stars from Dame Edna Everidge to the Spice Girls to Downtown Abbey's Hugh Bonneville. Paul is also the founder of True Funny, a new service offering creative consultancy and coaching to help speakers add more humor and likable storytelling to their work. He's here today to give us a few pointers to help us find our true funny by hiring the best, most knowledgeable, and let's face it, cheapest comedy writer money can buy, ourselves. Today, we're gonna to get a glimpse of his creative thoughts and how everyone can benefit from introducing thoughtfulness through laughter. Paul. Welcome. Ah, hello. Thank you very much. No, lovely to be here, George. Well, I want to jump <laughs> right into it and ask you to tell us how, and actually maybe more importantly, why you got started with comedy. Well, comedy's sort of been in my DNA. My dad was very funny. My dad was an Irish publican, and he basically spent his life standing at the end of the bar being amusing. He, he told lots of jokes, as they did in those days. And uh, that was his thing. But he was very witty and he was very funny and very sharp. And so I grew up with that. And then by the time I went to university, I went to Cambridge University. And uh, there there's a club called the Footlights, which is a very famous comedy club where Monty Python and all those guys, mm -hmm. John Cleese, all those sorts of guys, Eric Idle uh, had been there before me. So I got into that and I started writing comedy then. And then when I left, I uh, was an actor for a bit and I never got to do any comedy as an actor. So I thought this is no good. So I, I went into comedy as a writer. I, I've loved TV comedy. It's, a, it's full of fascinating, very smart people who are who are daring, who are super creative and who love ideas, which is what's you know lovely appearing on your podcast, which is about ideas. Because comedy is completely fueled by ideas. It takes on the world. It's it's about what's new. It's about what's daring. It's it's getting out there. Comedy grows stale really quickly. It's one of the great things about it, which is why it needs to be renewed constantly. And it's why, you know, th there's always a great churn in comedy because you can't just keep on doing the same thing. And even if even long run running comedies, what they do is they constantly reinvent themselves. They get new people involved and they take things in new directions. And, and comedy is like that to me. It's a wonderful opportunity to just explore the world in lots of different ways and uh and 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 get laughs and let's face it who doesn't want laughs in their life and uh so i'm very lucky to have had a working life being with people and it is quite fun when you're in the right company with comedians who can be quite amusing sometimes they're not as amusing as you'd imagine actually but sometimes they can be very amusing and also the people who are even more amusing, generally the writers, you know, comedy writers are very, very smart people. In fact, they should rule the world, in my opinion. If they <laughs> rule the world, <laughs> it'd be a great place. Yeah. What have you learned about laughter and how it improves that communication and that reinvention, right? That com comedy reinvention. And how does that really impact the end result of, I don't know, whatever is being worked on? The thing about laughter and comedy, this is why... I'm doing what I'm doing in True Funny, which is, which is about speaking in business, keynote speaking and speaking in general in business and trying to make people feel at home with their own humanity, really, because there's something about comedy that that, that is at us at our most human. And that often gets left out of the conversation or out of the idea in business because somehow that doesn't seem serious. Whereas to me, to me, comedy is the ultimately serious thing because it's telling the real truth about us in a way that, you know, bald statements about what you're like don't, you know, the way people behave and the things that they get wrong and the things where they get caught out, that's the real character test of someone, isn't it? That's how you really know them. And comedy is a brilliant way of understanding other people and also projecting yourself into the world. Um, 
and and you know because the science will tell you and i've looked into this i've actually done a bit of science which is very unusual for me because i'm not really a science person i've looked at science and science says that comedy actually releases all kinds of weird um hormones and uh that like oxytocin I'm gonna, i've written it down because i'm not very good at remembering these sciencey things oxytocin and um which is the trust hormone and also cortisol uh which is the stress hormone so um comedy actually when la real laughs make us less stressed they make us trust someone they give that sense of empathy so when you're with a group of people, you're standing in front of a group of people, if you can make them laugh, you're taking them to a totally different place in how they, they react to you. They, they, they feel safe with you, which is really important. They feel trust in you. They want to go on a journey with you. And, 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 and also the, the science uh, says that they, um, they listen to you much more and remember what you say. Uh, a, a, a truth put in terms of a joke that comes from a laugh is remembered by something like 70 percent more than a bare fact on a on a powerpoint the great big advantage right now is in being funny being warm being human being truthful i have to say paul when, when you start talking about science because that's my background right i i am a yeah, science, okay. i am a science nerd so um when we laugh we actually change our brain wave patterns that's how go. that's how deep it can get and we know yeah. that our our standard, uh, we call it basic beta. Um, when we change to aspiring alpha, that's where all of that creativity creativity comes in. And laughter is the fastest way to get there. Yeah, it's the big button, isn't it? It's the it big button really that that presses that, and it and because of the of of the trust things, it allows you because the trust then gives you the gateway to go down into that creativity. Because creativity is scary, isn't it? Let's face it. That's what great creativity is you're out there on it you know you, you're choosing to go out on that wobbly bridge across the ravine aren't you that's what creativity is it's not the safe place is to stay at home and not create anything just watch other people's creativity or be critical which is again a, a nice safe space but the really exciting space and that's where comedy inevitably takes you is out there onto that lonely bridge with the wind whistling by but on the other side is a goal, the gold of an unexplored territory. And you won't get there unless you take that risk. And comedy allows you with the trust that it builds and the force that it gives you allows you, helps you to take that risk. So let's let's explore that for a second. So not everybody is very attuned to to taking risks, right? Uh, the number yeah. one fear for most people in what we'll call the the developed world, and I really hate that term. Um is giving a speech. It's not even death, right? They're just terrified of giving a speech. So yeah, yeah. do you think that anyone could stand up in front of a group of people, deliver a speech, even if it's maybe just like a um, a project proposal or they're doing a financial review? And let's be honest, financial yeah. reviews are a bit, a bit dry, right? Do yeah, you think yeah. anybody would actually be able to add some humor into that, even if it's against their own nature and they're in that fear situation of standing up and delivering something like that. Well, the thing is, is it against their own nature? I mean, I, I, I don't know a human being who throughout their entire life has never made a joke or hasn't tried to be funny. I mean, basically, you know, maybe at work they don't, but the rest of their lives, what you're saying, they go to a barbecue at the weekend, they just sit there reading out, you know, reading out data. <laughs> I know there might be people like that, but I mean, even the nerds make each other laugh with data jokes, don't they? I mean, making, attempting humour amongst trusted people is a very natural thing. It's what everyone has got vast experience of it. You did it at school, you did it to your mum and your dad, you made your auntie laugh, you made the dog laugh. You can do these things. Of course you can. What you what your fear is telling is, is that you can't do it at work or can't do it when you're making a speech or doing a presentation. And the thing is, that's partly conditioning, is that, you know, business was a very serious thing and everyone had to put a suit on and everyone had to yeah. behave and use these weird words that they wouldn't <laughs> use anywhere else. You know, that, that was the way for decades, wasn't it? But that's all changing now. And, and, and you know, the, the, the more, one of the great, um, one of the great pluses, I suppose, of the post-pandemic world and the fact that business came into the home, didn't it, temporarily, and it's stayed there for a lot of people, is that it's humanised things. So people don't lose their 
no one's going to lose their job if someone interrupts a meeting with a, with a child or something like that anymore, which they probably would have done 10 years ago. You know, everything was so much more official and strict. And humour is part of that process. And yes, it's a little bit scary, but what you have to do is take baby steps and do it in a safe way for you, which is to find um, a process. And the process, just like standing up and speaking at any time, is really scary if, if you just ask people to do it off the blue but you know out of the blue but people prepare don't they i mean if someone asks you to speak you go away and you research and you work out your script and you think about what you're going to say and you prepare it and guess what you might practice it you might try it several times and get some feedback from people and adjust the script and do all that and then um then you go and do it and guess what it may not be perfect first time but then with patience you can learn to adjust it and get better at it i mean all these great stand-up comedians, the funniest comedians in the world, took years to be good at this. Do you think Seinfeld just walked onto the stage in his first gig and was brilliant? Nonsense. He spent years in terrible little comedy clubs being obscure. Even now, if he's doing a big set in uh, for his thing, he'll be practicing it in some tiny club in front of 10 people or 15 people. He works really hard at it. He prepares, he practices, and he's patient. And Seifel is one of the greatest comedians who ever lived. So for, for all of the rest of us, that's the same process, is that you prepare, you give yourself, you're patient enough to just try a few things. You know, when, when you say, you know, the presentations are very dry, if you've got a desert, a couple of springs of green really stand out. It's not that you have to spend your speech being hilarious. That's not your job. Your job is to deliver the information that you're doing in a speech. But, but if you pepper that with at the beginning and the middle and a few times and through it with green shoots of your personality, your stories, your life, the characters you've met, your truth, then it will be incredibly relatable to people. And a few laughs go a very, very long way, especially in a very dry environment. So, you know, you don't have to have gallons of water to feel to relieve a thirst you know sometimes just a sip will do and you, you've got to just be kind to yourself and be professional about it and and see it as a process of adding in things practice preparation practice and patience and and also a third fourth p i can add you know paul you need, you need obviously you need me um, oh, as your oh. guide and mentor <laughs> if i were getting up and getting ready and i need to focus on my audience while still being myself what are maybe three aspects for bringing that laughter out for somebody else well i mean the first biggest aspect is not jokes don't try and do jokes that's the business of a stand-up comedian who i say has been spent years training it and it's also the business of a different kind of arena really and i think for normal people talking what you need to be having is not jokes you you, you want stories and moments you want stories and moments and characters, little glimpses inside the truth um, uh, that are honest and believable and relatable. The things that you screwed up as a child, the extraordinary things your dad said when he was making you do the gardening that you still remember and a part of your life. All of these things, the mad teacher you had, um, the uh, I, I had a teacher at school, for example, who, who in those days have punished you in English schools. They used to make you write lines, which is to write the same sentence out a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Well, Mrs. Bruce, who was our maths teacher, was a bit strange. And her idea of a punishment was to make us draw five perfect washing machines, which actually took ages. And it was a totally bizarre thing, you know, <laughs> but that was her way. So, so that's, a, you know, so that's a little story from my life. Um, but I mean, what you really want is to be truthful to have a little bit of imagination as well to to take the things that have happened to you and and maybe play with them exaggerate them um turn them around the other way you know add some colors to them see them as a kind of a moment from a simpsons episode for example you know use characters from popular culture you know as a reference point to bring people in um you can say you know my dad was basically homer simpson but, you know, without the gut or, you know, you can say whatever you want. You know, what I mean? you, you use those things to, to to paint pictures for people. I think the thing that you want to be doing when you're um, in your humor as a normal person is paint these beautiful pictures. Where you go, yes, I was there. 
I know I, I've done that. I stood in the lift with a boss and not knowing what to say. You know, those little things that 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 that, that relate your life to theirs will create this moment of connection, which they'll be really grateful for. And people will reward you with laughter and their trust and they will listen to you. And the um, other thing is to be generous, of course, and kind and, and reflect on yourself. Humble. If you're humble, generous, kind, then people will feel trust in what you're having to say because you're if anyone if you're going to be mocking anyone you're mocking yourself first and foremost and that that is an extremely valuable place to go making yourself vulnerable actually there's 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 something about humor which is a kind of vulnerability and and you know those people a lot of people do it and people stand up and say they're really bad things that have happened to them and these are very truthful stories and people get touched in their heart they can also get touched in their heart by the really ridiculous things that have happened because that they can just see themselves saying or doing the same things as you did and 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 wishing that they weren't you know very glad that they weren't in your shoes so there's a bit of relief there too um i mm -hmm. always use the rule and this is a lesson i learned a long time ago uh because i used to do introduce some comedy by self degradation even though i was relating to yeah. some of my stuff and i make fun of myself and then somebody came up to me after and they're like it was funny but it took away from the power of everything else that you were saying because you're destroying your own credibility so yeah i'm i'm okay with telling and being vulnerable a story that might be, seem a little embarrassing but i no longer elate myself into a negative when doing oh sure sure i mean it, it's it's about the framing of that you see i yeah. mean you, you, if you're framing that as something that you've learned from then then it becomes a powerful thing the thing that you screwed up because you've 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 taken that lesson you've made and you're, you're aware of it because it's a self-awareness thing i'm not saying yeah just yeah. rubbish for laughs not at no. all um it's that you know it's it's it's, it's because what you're trying to do is the, the the sarcasm and the kind of point scoring and critical stuff it's 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 outside of yourself you see that's that's external isn't it that's i mean that's why it's the great um kind of comedy that teenagers do and students do because they're, they're protecting themselves because they're just ripping down other people society or the evil politicians or their mums and dads and you know they're fine they're brilliant but as you grow older and you go mature obviously you include yourself in the bad people or you include yourself in the people who made mistakes and that becomes even more relatable because showing that kind of the right kind of vulnerability as somebody who's very experienced, right? You, you have your stories from your life and I'm sure you have them written down and and you can walk in and out quite easily of that that real experience. What are activities that you do to keep yourself sharp and creative? I just get up in the morning and start breathing, really. I mean, I'm just <laughs> lucky that I've got... <laughs> I'm a terrible person. I mean, I don't really stop. Um... I can, I, I like to go and see things. I think it's very important to see see as much as you can and afford to, or try and go and do really odd things now and again. You know, go and see a poetry reading. I went to a poetry reading up the road uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was fantastic. You know, it just takes you to a totally different place. I'm not a big ballet fan, but maybe I'll go and see, maybe I should make myself go. You know, when you go to anything and see anything, a film of, a play, a concert, a classical concert, a school concert, whatever you're doing, it, it sort of, it adds up into being a spark. It challenges you. And you can, and even if it's terrible, in fact, it's probably better if it's terrible, to be honest with you, because then you start going, well, how would I do this that would be much better? How would I, what would I do? What, 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 what would I like to see happening here? Can I retell that story? That's a, half a good character. What's the other half? And you find yourself asking those questions. And I think the important thing is to ask those questions. And if you can, write them down and write down some of your answers. I mean, again, it's partly being uh, turning your thoughts into words and putting the words down so you remember them. So it's a create, it's again, it's, it's, it's entering a deliberate process with the world where the world makes an offer and you counter offer, which is what they say in, in improv. And you you say yes. And you listen to what's going on and you sort of run with it. So being playful as well is important and not and not always seeing the outcome, not always wondering, 
Yeah, it's a right. I mean, I have stupid ideas for companies all the time. And I don't, I don't know if you if you do or anyone else. But I mean, I've I've created about eighty companies in my head, and, and of course, done none of them. But um, I do that all the time. I've, I've, I own a load of URLs for companies that never going to happen, <laughs> but they seemed a brilliant idea on Friday night. And you know, I think it's just you. you you just got to enjoy that as 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 a as an activity like anything else you know you just got to not with an end in sight sometimes it's just practice just running with the thing what happens next okay so people are eating a lot of bread maybe they like butter maybe you know, i should have a butter company you know and uh, you just <laughs> and you think yes I'm actually building a butter company and getting a shop and furnishing it and actually learning about how to make butter is a different thing. And I haven't quite found time to do that, but I quite enjoyed, I quite enjoyed, I quite enjoyed the day or two. I was a, a, a massive butter entrepreneur. And uh, that's, that's, that's the way I roll really. I mean, it's, it's a bit nonstop. Maybe I'll run out of steam one day, but I do love, I do love ideas. I mean, this is why it's lovely to appear on an ideas a uh, podcast like this for people who love them as well because it's just it's a habit isn't it i mean it's yeah. like being cynical is a habit but having ideas is a habit it's a good habit to have and um and you've got to just try and put in as much different stimulation as wide as stimulation as possible i think when we were talking about being intuitive right and great comedians don't do that the person that i always think of that seemed to be able to do it on the drop of a dime was always Robin Williams. Yes. Well, he was different. He he was different. Yeah. I can't remember where I saw it and it was quite old, but like this was like during his Mork and Mindy days. So way back, yeah. he said, when people don't see me, all I'm doing is reading and experiencing and pulling yeah. all of these different things. And he's like, the one mm -hmm. thing about me that people don't get is I have an amazing memory. Yeah, so they he do. was able to do that because he had all of these connections to yeah. so many things. Um, but then you well, you'll find that a lot of comedians are have that memory. They, you know, if you said, "Oh, what happened on that day?" That you know that that they go, "Yeah, I remember that. That crowd wasn't very good." You know, you think you've done three hundred gigs. That <laughs> what are you doing talking about that? How do you remember this stuff? And and you know. Having a great memory is a, is a huge blessing, and yeah, and, the, and and everything that they do is being filed away now, whether they write it down or not. And, and, and believe me, very little is as spontaneous as it looks, you know. And, and spontaneity is a habit, you know. People, I've got a friend who does a lot of improv, and you know that you go to um, spontaneity, you know, they, when they're asking, you know, you get any crowd and you say, name a room in, in a house, there will be two rooms that they're going to say. <laughs> Okay, the kitchen and the bathroom. bathroom. You can look That's as right. surprised as you like. That no, it is always kitchen rooms. and bathroom. It is. It's always the kitchen or the bathroom. Yeah. It's very rarely the spare bedroom. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And if it is the spare bedroom and all the other people, they pretend not to have heard that one. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot more things that that are planned and 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 experience. You know, people have people have have have, have habits. Have you know? habits of creativity as well they see things and they work on them and they they tell stories in the same kind of rooms and they tell Agatha Christie told stories around the same kind of people and the same fractures in society didn't she she was brilliant at it Paul tell us how for our audio listeners because uh, I'll put the links obviously um, onto the video and stuff how somebody could reach out to you if they wanted to investigate their true funny well, I'd love to hear from people, and uh, my you can get me on LinkedIn at Paul Dornan. I think I'm the only one. There's a, there's an American senator called Paul Dornan, but I don't know if he's on LinkedIn. And um, or at truefunny.co.uk, truefunny.co.uk. Uh, but I'd love to hear from you, and uh, yeah, yeah help you find that true funny. It's inside you guys. It's in there all along. You've been funny. You've been funny this weekend. I bet you have. And you just now to now need to be funny in exactly the same way at work. Mm. Well, fantastic discussion. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Total pleasure, George. Lovely to meet you.